saw the Gina Manovo, um uh, series at Museum of Modern Art. I think it was 1969-1970. And I saw there uh, Taron Trans uh, Land and Anguish. And, it, uh, and also, also was Fousey's. But Land and Anguish was very, very strong. I felt a very... I'd never seen anything quite like the combination of styles and um, quite honestly just the, the, the humanity and the passion of the film was so powerful. So when Antonio Desmortes opened mm -hmm. at the Bleecker Street Cinema uh, and I saw the name Russia you know, I went immediately to see this. And I, I don't think at that time, you have to understand it's a very different time. At that time, every day, or every, maybe I exaggerate, every three days, there was a new masterpiece <laughs> from Italy, from France, from Japan, from everywhere. I mean, it was all over. And all of a sudden, Antonio Desmotas comes on the screen and wipes them all away. <laughs> And I, I can only say this from an emotional standpoint because um, I, I don't have the intellectual background of understanding the politics and understanding the nature of what was going on in Brazil at the time. I really understand, I really come from a working class background of uh, Sicilians uh, in the Lower East Side of New York, which was like living in a little village until I went to uh, Washington Square College, which was New York University, which was in Greenwich Village. Then it began to open up a little bit and, and this extraordinary influx of um, uh, films uh, of recreating, you have to understand, not just, not just good movies, but recreating cinematic language was happening every three or four days <laughs> from different parts of the country, not even to mention um, Andy Warhol or um, Cassavetes, for example. This was the key uh, in, in 1968, you know, or actually 1959 with Shadows. So this was a time when we all expected anything could happen with cinema, and cinema was going to be the savior of the world in a sense, and uh, uh, the world being in a, a terrible state, maybe not as, as bad as it is now, but at that time a very bad state politically in, in, in every way. And so um, when I saw Antonio Desmortes, it seemed to cut through all politics, uh, it made politics irrelevant in a way, because it dealt with a truth and a passion that was primal that was, you know, there are those who have and those who have not. And uh, uh, those who have not will be heard and eventually will come from the earth. It's almost as if it's something that was from primeval times where the people in the film look as if they came out of the earth, you know. And this is like a primal um, uh, mythology that was created up there on the screen, but Interestingly enough, not just from the, from the uh, tradition and the culture of Brazil, which was kind of new to me, but also from different cultures and different, um, um, not different cultures, different styles of filmmaking. <laughs> from Italy, from America, from the American Western, you know, as translated through the Italian Western, which by that, by that time, at that time, we were such diehard uh, American Western enthusiasts, uh, having grown up with them as young boys, uh, John Ford, Howard Hawks, etc., Bud Bedecker, and of course the, at that time Sam Peckinpah was, was the, the, final, the final statement of the American Western. We were so, um, at that time, so um, uh, uh, militant about the American Western that we reacted, myself and a number of other people reacted against the Leone films. We didn't, we felt that, oh, the, uh, the Italians can't make Italian. I love Antonioni, we love Fellini, we love De Sica, of course, and Bertolucci, Bellocchio, you know, I mean, uh, so much Pasolini, but, but uh, the Western, this is American. It took me, it took me, um, in the meantime, I saw Antonio Dos Mortes, but I did not have that feeling about Antonio. Antonio Dos Mortes is something different. It took elements of the Western, it took elements of the translation of the Western uh, by Leone and the other Italians. It took me four years to begin to appreciate, four or five years to begin to appreciate really beyond that point, the Leone films and uh, uh, that Once Upon a Time in the West then became one of my favorite films and um, I, I had to learn to come to it that it was not a Western, that it's an Italian film, that it's more in the tradition of grand opera uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Leone's style was so extraordinary and so unique. Um, and that it took me a number of years, I got to know Leone, and then actually, at one point, back in 1978, gave me a print of Once Upon a Time in the West, which I kept here at the, with our collection. Um, but the thing about the Antonio Das Mortes was that, yes, it takes elements of the American Western, but also translated through the Italian Western at that time. Um, there were, how can I say, I can't, 
I could not react to the picture um, analytically because I was overwhelmed by the film and I was overwhelmed by uh, the style of the film and uh, by again just the the truth over politics and when what I mean by that is that the politics are there it's obvious um, but I hadn't seen it handled with such honesty um, and in such an interesting way and uh, I hadn't seen it handled that way since I saw the first neorealist films um, of uh, De Sica and Rossellini when I was five years old, which was Bicycle Thief and Paisa. Uh, and uh, they were of a different style, but that hit the truth in a certain way, and Antonio hits that way the same, in the same manner. Um, I had a similar feeling to seeing Pasolini's first film, Akatoni, around the same time. But Antonio takes, Antonio Dos Mortes goes off on another level, um, and it, because it comes out, it, the ritual, the ritual, um, even though I may not have been familiar with uh, some of the rituals depicted in the picture, uh, they create a, an atmosphere where anything is possible. Uh, and you could follow the story to a certain extent. You understand the, the logics, the, 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 the nature of the story. But the, the sense of um, the dispossessed and the sense of the dispossessed are always with us uh, and that they will be heard from. This is inevitable. And you get this from his work. You get this in particular Antonio and also, of course, in uh, Land in Anguish. And so for me, ultimately, um, I became obsessed with the film. And I, I took, um, I remember I took uh, my friend uh, from Time magazine, Jay Cox, to, to see it. And <laughs> He was, he reacted against it, but years later he liked it, there's no day, he, he was sort of a reviewer, at the, he was reviewing at the time, and, and, uh, and you have to understand that uh, uh, reviewers uh, of periodicals have to see four or five films a day, three films a day, you know, uh, suddenly this thing comes on the screen, he thought it was too excessive, too over the, I said, no, no, this is really important. We got to meet uh, Glover when he came to New York that time, in a, in a, in a uh, restaurant uptown, uh, just for coffee, and he, and uh, the Time Magazine gentleman did a, an interview of his, mm -hmm. of him, and that's when I first met him. And it took a few years, but my friend came around. Uh, he was the same, he, he also, with me, didn't, reacted against the Leone films. And then years later, it came around, so, but, um, but what Antonio Dos Mortes is something, um, uh, the style is very important. Um, there are elements, as I say, of the Western, of course, but, um, uh, and this is pretty obvious in terms of the cangueciero and, and the, the, the uh, type of a bandit you can, uh, Americans can immediately, uh, who have seen American cinema, Westerns can immediately uh, equate with that. But it's, it's also the, there's something about the um, nature of um, the music. The music, for me, is narrative in the film. It tells the story, the music. And uh, I became obsessed with the music. I finally got copies of all of it and I put it on my audio tape and, I, and when I was driving, I was living in Los Angeles in 1972 to 1983 and I played in the car all the time. <laughs> and the thing about it, I, I started giving copies of the film uh, to uh, musicians, composers to look at uh, at that time in Los Angeles, actors. Uh, but primarily, the, the thing is that the narrative is told through the music also. Uh, now, I don't know, I can't, I, I'm not, an authority on it, so I can't tell you, you know better than me, all the different meanings of the different types of music used in the picture. But um, there is one important thing, and it has to do with the ballad, the, the, the idea of um, probably one of the most extraordinary things in that film is the moment in which the old blind man is carried on a litter and the camera just tracks along with him. They're preparing for the final battle, and the camera goes on and on and on. It keeps tracking. And this extraordinary ballad is, is being sung on the track um, with these great lyrics about Lampiao, I believe, and going down to hell and fighting all the devils. Um, and, I, you know, we come to think of it, we, we were talking about it the other day, and we are talking about the, that, in a way, he, at that time, was using film, I mean, using Antonio Desmortes is using cinema sort of as powerful as uh, Bob Dylan, the music and the songs that Bob Dylan was writing and playing at that time, Masters of War, particularly uh, that particular song, 
that particular ballad, and Antonio Desmortes is like a, like a rolling stone. It just goes, <laughs> and like if you listen as an American, I don't know about foreign, but, uh, but if you listen to uh, like a rolling stone repeatedly, which I just did a documentary on Bob Dylan, it, it still has the power, uh, the song still has the power, and uh, uh, this, is, this is something that over the years I began to realize about, about the use of music in this film. But automatically, I must say, I responded to the film emotionally, and, and I responded to the, the, the truth of the street the truth of the earth. In other words, as I said, the people who have not will, will be heard from. And I think this is something that there will be a day of reckoning. And I think this film shows that. And I think all of Chinaman Wovo, I think at that time, was, was expressing that. I mean, the whole world was going that way, and it is, it is that way now, too. Antonio Desmortes makes it very clear it's the haves and the haves not. You know, you could give or you could take. You could share. <laughs> And the ones who don't, they're going to come out of that, that uh, from that wherever they were. Who Serato is called the the, small, the the area where the, the woman with the knife, the um, the extraordinary the rituals uh, that are enacted. And one of the greatest moments in the picture too is the is the uh, uh, is the way the intensity builds with the music. It becomes like a ritual. It becomes like a religious um, uh, chant or an incantation. Uh, there's a moment where a woman, an older woman, starts singing, and I think it's when Antonio Desmortes starts to fight for the first time with another of the Congress heroes. They put the um, handkerchief between the uh, between themselves. One whole bites the one end of the handkerchief, and the other bites the other, and it's all one take. And recently, when I screened the film again, I screened the film again for I screened the film twice this the past few years. Um, uh, once for Gangs of New York, and once for uh, this film, The Departed, this gangster film I'm doing. And I, again, if you watch that take, how all the elements fall together, how uh, you watch from the beginning of the take, I think it's about a 10 minute take, uh, there's dialogue and then the two characters move, suddenly the sky, I think it starts to rain or something, you begin to hear a woman singing, um, and then they start to fight, and the guy, I think it looks very real, uh, where one of, the, one of the characters gets hit with a knife, um, uh, and the tension of the two men pulling on the, uh, on the handkerchief, uh, on the camera moves. The camera moves um, create something that um, uh, is an extraordinarily um, emotionally powerful uh, moment. But it's it's that kind of thing too, where you know everything is working for the filmmaker when all those elements come together. I don't know whether it's the actors, the weather, uh, the camera movement. Uh, somehow, if he had designed it, I'm sure he did. Um, but somehow, when you're working like that with a group, and I could see that everybody was, uh, everyone was, uh, what's the word, uh, 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 committed. To making something special, and I say it all comes together, you know. Uh, and so this is a very, you know, that that's one. I, it's one of the high high points of my film make my film going experiences to see this and to be enlightened by this picture. And because also, you know, the, the, interesting, the interesting thing about the, the Russia films is that there was no, it just there was no attempt at. Um, how should I say? He, he dealt with similar subject matter that was coming from Europe, um, but dealing with the European society post-war. But he dealt with it in such a way that was so um, uh, direct. And so um, uh, it may have had elements of the Baroque, it may have had elements of, of uh, as I say, the Western and so many other different elements, but there was something about it that uh, there were no excuses. There were just, uh, this is the truth.